When Frederick Jurgensen inadvertently captured human voices whilst recording birdsong, many operators took inspiration from his spontaneous success to trial the use of an additional background sound as a source wave for the modulation of EVP. Having obtained the very clear voices of two elderly ladies during my initial trial of an electronic dictaphone without a supplementary source, I question its necessity. Sophia did it. Sophia did it. Sophia did it. Who's that Sophia? Who's that Sophia? Who's that Sophia? As our group recorded in a rural location, I considered what imperceptible residual environmental noise was being manipulated. The sources I considered were radio waves, nearby livestock, Wi-Fi, electrical noise from domestic appliances and the inherent noise of the recording device. Some factors could be controlled by turning off the electrical supply or by shielding equipment, but positive results persisted. We pose the question to communicators of how sound is modulated to form EVP and receive the following response. So even if you were talking, you could pick up on the energy that way somehow. Somehow change the waves. Somehow change the waves. Somehow change the waves. The answer, although affirming modulation is taking place, does not provide a specific source of its generation. Carrier waves generated by an oscillator are rarely employed as a background for EVP modulation. When we experimented briefly with sine waves, the clinical sound did nothing to facilitate the formation of human speech, and in our small room resulted in nausea and headaches. The testing was abandoned. In 1974, ITC operator and physical medium William J. O'Neill was commissioned and funded to perform experiments by George Meek, who reported success with their Mark II device, using a 1200 MHz oscillator. Spiricom, as it was later called, produced an almost robotic voice, whose language required a concerted effort to discern. I've attempted to replicate these experiments unproductively with a variety of mechanistic waveforms, but when I revert to human speech, success is achieved in varying degrees. Operators in the UK researching for EVP who are receiving consistently clear communication report experimental success using a background of unintelligible human speech to facilitate modulation. Background sound files are created using a foreign speaker in a tongue not known to the operator and having a distinctly different phonology, such as a Slavic language. The background recording is then reversed and spliced before reviewing to ensure that any speech perceived as having a meaning in English is removed. It is rare that each uniquely generated background recording is used on more than one occasion. But to test how different communicator teams might modulate the same recording, I supplied a scrambled Norwegian speaker in 10 second bursts to another operator. We both achieved positive results, but the character of EVP communication we received was incomparable. Regardless of the unintelligibility of the background recording, I have experimented successfully using vocal pitches between 85 and 255 hertz. This frequency range was chosen because the average span of adult human speech is 85 to 180 hertz for men and 165 to 255 hertz for women. Working without a carrier wave does appear to severely hinder responses for operators with less experience and those who record infrequently for short sessions. I reserve this method only for sporadic use when working alone but the capture rate does consistently increase when working with a language background versus a state of quietude in this circumstance. I believe the use of a carrier should therefore be a personal choice unless the mechanics of capture is under scrutiny, when shielding is desirable. We accept there will be a natural hesitancy for listeners to unquestionably accept an EVP 
when it was modulated from a generated background or carrier wave. Regardless of your trust in the operator, if you are not physically present at the time of recording and did not participate in the following review, it can be difficult to appreciate the genuine nature of the phenomena and question the bias of how EVP are created and isolated. When doubt arises, the evidential content of the EVP message may substantiate its genuine nature, providing, of course, it is contextual and demonstrates the sentience of the speaker. My preference when recording with members of the group is to work without provision of an additional carrier wave and reduce any ambient environmental sounds to a minimum where control permits. A visitor to our group requested the use of white noise random radio signals of equal intensity at different frequencies. DRV had not been previously attempted by our group and no voices were heard and the noise proved to be disruptive to our way of sitting. Personally, I found focusing during the session almost impossible and regardless of the amplitude used, our communicators were not able to modulate language from the source and reviewing the recording made for painful listening. In our own domestic setting, our recordings have demonstrated residual environmental noises and the device's noise are more than proficient for the modulation of EVP. The radio experiment will not be repeated. Professor Charles Tart, psychologist and parapsychologist, argues that EVP is nothing more than stray radio waves and those who study this field have not demonstrated the necessary research disciplines to produce credible evidence. I have some sympathy with Tar in the desire to follow the scientific method, however his statement is incorrect. The phenomena have consistently been captured during controlled shielding experiments. In 2012, Annabella Cardoso performed a series of experimental recordings in an acoustic studio with a high level of sound insulation and electromagnetic shielding. Voices were captured, although these were considerably softer than those captured in unshielded environments. As a group, we have not had the opportunity to record in scientifically controlled environments, but instead have experimented with metallicized Faraday shielding bags as used by the military. Our results generally echo those of Cardoso, with only rare exceptions of clear voices. The language of EVP falls broadly into three categories, direct responses, conversations between speakers and those who are unaware of our presence. The commonality between all categories is that the speaker's language is in the present tense. Regardless of when a speaker physically died, recordings hint that that time may be multi-layered and traversable from their perspective they are not constrained by the linear rules that we live by. From piercing together thousands of clips, a picture emerges of speakers living within a period that was contemporary to their physical life. However, they are seemingly able to leave this at will and communicate with us when they desire. Messages spoken through EVP have the capability to portray the linguistic characteristics of the mortal voice belonging to an individual. Our recognition of speakers who actively assist and guide our research is aided by their distinctive national and regional accents. This aspect of the phenomena has given us confidence to identify and place our trust in communicators who engage in post-mortem research before passing over and whose interest in the subject remains active. A female Scottish medium, Helen, who first appeared to us through Transfiguration, but who also frequently speaks through EVP, has a distinctive accent. Whilst her messages are usually supportive, should she take a dislike to a visitor, her language may be colourful which is a character trait that was documented by those she worked with before her passing. (laughs) 
Few EVP operators have the capability to meaningfully analyse vocal characteristics of their recordings, and external examination of waveforms is costly and not open to the lay researcher. It would be ideal to have a comparative recording of the captured voice of a speaker when alive, but as few communicators provide their full identity, or lived in a period when voices were recorded, it's rarely possible to match a speaker to a clip. In 2006, Paolo Prezzi, in the analysis of a short utterance, lists several anomalies including poor melodic and harmonic contents, expanded vowels, abnormal fluctuations of the voice and possible dysphonia. In contrast to Prezzi, our recordings, when captured without use of a background noise, are more akin to our voices, both in waveform and amplitude. The similarity between Trace's voice and a communicator's voice is striking and highlights the normality of speech we obtain in seance sittings. The voices of those who communicate portray every emotion that we are capable of. When a direct response is received, the tone of the speaker's voice can be affecting to listen to. During a sitting, Helen was asked to come forward, but it was a gentleman who responded, not to the sitter, but to advise Helen. This comment not only illustrates the speaker's cognizance of who was present on our side, but of cautious behaviour. Without any visual cues, humans have an innate ability albeit to differing degrees of how we gauge the personality of a speaker. Phil McAleer in 2014 at the University of Glasgow asked 320 people to rate the word hello on a scale of 1 to 9 for specific personality traits including trustworthiness, dominance and attractiveness. From a strikingly short utterance, listeners reported a high consistency of perceived personality only attractiveness fell outside of a broad consensus, which being a subjective experience might be expected. If we apply the study findings to the interpretation of those whom we record, especially when the same voice is captured repeatedly, our perceptions of communicators may be considered accurate. During a field recording, I captured the voice of a gentleman. The EV clearly imparts not only his nationality, but the enunciation reflects a high level of education. Without additional information, it would be difficult to place the speaker. But knowing this clip was captured at a prominent High Church of England building, its context holds more meaning and creates a mental picture of how the speaker might appear. In the first year of recording, whilst appreciative of receiving clear voices and contextual messages, we were perplexed as to why most EVP were spoken by female communicators. Our concern was that external listeners, knowing that our group consisted of only women, would assume that the clips were of our voices. To address this, we asked that more men came forward with voices that would be easily distinguished from our own. Almost immediately, the balance of male to female voices changed and it is now men who speak more frequently on recordings. It was Charlie who became our first regular male communicator. He was easily recognised by his accent and upbeat demeanour. The cottage where recordings were held was situated close to an active military base. And for three days each year, fast jets skimmed the roof during displays for the air show. On the last evening when the jets were grounded, we gathered for a sitting. It was no surprise to hear Charlie's voice, and his comment could not have been more pertinent, as a C-130 Hercules had recently departed. Hello. Glass just going up. Hello. Glass just going up. Hello. Obtaining four names upon request has been relatively easy, although most speakers are adamant in refusing to provide their surname. 
those who are reportedly seen and described by sitters as they transfigure in seances are more likely to let us know of their identity. This is the energy. Go. 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 However, there remain only a few communicators that we have a detailed knowledge of. Charlie is an exception, but it took years of piecing together brief EVP to learn that he was a World War II aircraft mechanic who came from Arsenal, a residential area of North London. We are still unable to formally identify him, as his family name and service number are yet to be provided. The discovery of why there is such a resistance to withhold information that would definitively identify a speaker is an ongoing quest. Aside from the anomalous character of EVP, associated linguistic anomalies exist that are beyond explanation by even the most experienced and open-minded operator. Examples of EVP that fall into this category are the voices of members whose words are transformed through modulation, the content of EVP being modified after archiving, messages in foreign languages that cannot be identified, receiving only English EVP when recording overseas, and messages that are complete nonsense. The instinctual reaction is to dismiss all recordings that fall within these categories as human error or misinterpretations. And in the first few years, we did. However, they continue to be captured and regardless of our lack of understanding in why they are transmitted, I believe they are worthy of consideration. The most entertaining of the anomalies is the modulation by communicators of group members' speech into passages that are not only uncharacteristic of their vocal tone, but are also grammatically uncomfortable. An apt example was the hijacking of my voice to convey what the speaker had seen during a series of multiple transfigurations in a seance. The EVP is loud and the speaker sounds excited before my voice abruptly returns to my normal timber when I ask Tracy about the position of the cabinet curtains. Oh, look at that. It was funny. It was like ping pong, wasn't it? They were taking turns. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, look at that. It was funny. It was like ping pong, wasn't it? They were taking turns. Oh, look at that. It was funny. It was like ping pong, wasn't it? This type of anomaly has been distinct to seance recordings and because the phenomenon is so specific, I would theorise that it requires the group's collective energy to facilitate the manipulation of language in this way. Uncontextual nonsense EVP, but messages retaining clear enunciation, began to be recorded after the study began in 2008 and continues to the present day. Principally, they feature in longer focus recordings such as seances. Here are two examples, one in my voice and one in Tracy's voice. Both of these voices demonstrate the intellectual absurdity of the phenomenon. Unlike our modulated voices being morphed by speakers to wear their observations, these clips bear no relevance to our conversation and have no easily discernible purpose other than possibly as a demonstration of the speaker's ability to alter waveforms or as an experiment in transmission from their side. EVP in foreign languages is scarcely recorded, and rarer still are strings of words in multiple languages. When performing solo recording experiments, I may begin by asking communicators to come forward by greetings in English, Arabic, French or German. But to date, direct responses have been in English. Only in seance room conditions when multiple people are present and non-English EVP captured. The first message we received in an unknown foreign language was incomprehensible. But individually the words do have meaning and are possibly from three individual languages. Let's 
Irav is a Sanskrit name that translates as having infinite strength. Sanka is Old Norse, meaning to gather, and Kumpf is a Germanic surname. Combining a cumulative meaning from the proposed translation would be tenuous, and I recognise that my interpretation may not be correct, resulting in the provisional meaning being defunct. Interpreting for an EVP is demanding, especially when the sentence structure is unfamiliar. An EVP of a simple Arabic phrase was understandable, but the words were in reversed order to their common usage. The phrase Marsalam had been changed to Salam Ma. Which could literally be interpreted as peace water. Curiously, routinely placed under my chair for seances is a decorated Arabic bowl full of water. When recording overseas in a country whose native tongue is distinctly different from your own, you might logically expect to record samples of native speakers. But in our experience, this has not proven to be the case. Reaction to our presented recordings of overseas EVP has been almost universally hostile because we have recorded no foreign speakers. All voices were in English. Recorded voices in Norway were disconcertingly familiar. At the Folk Museum in Oslo, in the quiet month of February, standing on the porch of an old church, we captioned the name of Rawley. Rawley's name has been captured 26 times during field trips to Tudor and Elizabethan buildings. We have no proof that it relates to Sir Walter Rawley, but assume it to be him due to his link with the locations. I was unable to find any documentation to support that Rawley had visited Norway. Only reference to a comment he made regarding his discovery of the Trinidadian pitch lake, it melteth not the sun as the pitch of Norway. If the speaker isn't Rawley, the reason for providing his name is open to conjecture. The number of words received in an EVP message, based on our library of 15,000 clips, ranges commonly between one and five. This would fit with the findings of Dr Carlo Trina from Friends in Italy whose review of 24,000 clips gathered from four operators showed a maximum of around five syllables per capture. Alexander McRae puts forward three to four words of between 1.5 to 1.75 seconds, yet the duration of our highly articulated clips ranges from one to five seconds. Longer strings of less intelligible speech by multiple speakers are often captured. Anant Senkowski reported an outstanding sentence consisting of 36 syllables. From this we may see that a blanket statement of the duration of EVPs is not possible. I consider the likely factors to influence the capture rate are environmental conditions and how the recording is affected by the operator. When focusing on EVP as communications, it's helpful to be aware of the mechanics of human speech how we anatomically influence the sounds that we produce and our individual ability to differentiate between acoustic patterns. The building blocks of speech are individual sounds or phonemes. When combined, these form words or morphemes, and in turn, sentences are formulated. These are further coloured by the tempo, stress and intonation of the speaker. The process of producing intelligible speech is uniquely human and dependent on our physical bodies. And whilst operators have put forward theories for how ITC speech is captured, Buckner and Buckner in 2012 stated the capability to assess their claim scientifically is not possible. Accepting that those who communicate through EVP use a non-mechanistic method to protect speech it should be no surprise that the unusual inflections on vocal modulation will arise. However, our library of supporting EVP for this essay demonstrates that clear, understandable speech is frequently captured during recordings. During a seance sitting in August 2008, which was chosen at random, 23 EVP were captured that were perceived as being Class A. Four were single monosyllabic words. The remainder were names or coherent sentences. The number and ratio of words class B for the same sitting were almost identical. 
Over the following year, the quantity of captured EVP varied, but the pattern of language complexity remained consistent. Direct replies to questions were more likely to be obtained when only regular sitters attended a recording, but names were freely given to all attendees, whether the speaker was known to the sitter or not. There is an undoubted bias in the interpretation and recording of EVP, as each operator becomes practised at hearing their own unique channel of communication. Practitioners have often likened this process to learning a new language. I began a study of the language contained in our archive some time ago, but with over 13 years of data to collate and many hundreds of recordings, a summary finding is not to be expected for some years yet. Until then, the most salient points are that messages are in the present tense, unless the speaker refers to their previous lives, when the past tense is used. Whether this reflects other operators' results is unknown as none to my knowledge have actively mined their data in a similar way. There are many intriguing and perplexing anomalies in the pattern of language within EVP, and none that we can fully explain. Operators known to me in the UK capture similar phenomena, but their results are rarely reported to a wide audience, or documented to any depth. The reporting of communications that go beyond normal speech patterns has led to open ridicule by those who are not fully conversant with recognised anomalies, and even by those within the community. It is my hope that in airing perplexing aspects of EVP, others may be encouraged to share their results, so that a wider sample is available for analysis, and with it, discussion that may lead to a greater understanding of the phenomena.